it's one of the most extraordinary expeditions ever undertaken. We follow six British Army soldiers as they attempt to become the first all-female team to trek 1,700 kilometers across Antarctica, unaided and using muscle power alone. All novices, none have been to the South Pole before and must master the vital skills to survive in the most hostile environment on Earth. They will battle brutal conditions. We knew a plane couldn't come and fetch us. You know, nobody was going to come and rescue us. And struggle with illness. Had we possibly slowed down, she might not have suffered as, as badly as she did. To prove that women have the mental stamina and physical endurance to achieve this record-breaking endeavour. It's day one of a training and planning process that will take two years to handpick a select team of women who will attempt to ski across Antarctica. Over 250 troops have applied, but only six will have the strength and tenacity to make the final shortlist for Exercise Ice Maiden. Serving soldiers rotating on deployment, four of them share their remarkable story. I'm definitely one of those people that if I see an opportunity, I'm going to just jump on it. And even if I think I've got no chance of making the team, which I genuinely, genuinely didn't. But I also think if you don't apply for something, then you never know whether someone else might see something in you that you haven't seen yourself. The applicants are set a series of command tasks to test their initiative. That's it. Is that it? I'd never pulled a tyre before. Why would you? <laughs> It was freezing cold that morning, and the minute we got these tyres, I thought, well, actually, because of all the frost, it's like ice, it should slide quite easily. But it turns out, no, um, it melted the frost quite quickly, and then the tyre just stuck on the grass, and uh, I hadn't expected them to be that hard to pull. That's it, good ladies, well done, keep it going! The Antarctic Challenge is the brainchild of two British Army doctors, and they know the calibre of woman they're after. It is physically possible to get anybody fit to do this in two years, and we knew that. So it was really looking at the attitude to it. Um, what was really interesting is that you've got really, really fit people, really competitive people who are quite used to being at the front of any race that they do. And then when they started to slip back and they weren't quite at the front, they almost gave up and they're like, well, I'm not, I'm not doing so well anymore. Whereas the people sort of in the middle, towards the end, they just kept going. They were doing it for the team doing it for everything rather than just themselves. I was probably about middle of the pack, I think, but I, I just kept going and a couple of people would sort of start walking and I'd sort of try and make sure I'd go back and try and encourage them to go along because I figured that at the end of the day it's going to be a team exercise. From Wales, applicants will take part in several overseas exercises in polar conditions. In Antarctica, they could face 60 mile per hour winds and minus 50 degree conditions. During exercise Ice Bambi in the Arctic Circle, the women undertake a crash course in winter survival skills with the help of the Royal Marines and the Norwegian Army. You make a cross like this and this. And then it will stay. In Antarctica, they could have to ski up to 50 kilometres a day. With only two resupply points along the whole route, they must pull all their food and kit on sledges called pulks. Everything's on the bulk. You don't want things on your back, not only just for balance, but the minute you put stuff against your back, you start to sweat. Um, uh, and, and sweating is not good in Antarctica because then it freezes and you lose thermal properties. At the South Pole, the Ice Maidens will live in tents, but these could be damaged by severe winds. You build a mound up of, uh, at least your head height. Knowing how to construct an emergency shelter with snow could end up saving their lives. Partway through the first week, I think we were told we were going to go and sleep in our own luxury ice hotel. Um, of course it wasn't. <laughs> it was uh, a Quincy, so a massive mound of snow, and we went out and found a, a patch where we could um, dig to start with, mound all the snow um, into a, a big dome, and then we all jumped on it, which was probably the most fun bit. Squash it all down, compress it, um, and then we went in at the bottom and basically sort of hollowed out uh, a little cave from the, from the base of that dome to then uh, be big enough to have two double beds. You look good. There is a fifth body there, you just can't see her. She's in. 
just see my eyes. <laughs> you have your little candle in there, which shows that there's enough oxygen in there, because if the candle goes out, then you've not got enough oxygen for it to burn, so you might be in a little bit of trouble. So you keep an eye on that, uh, and yeah, with, the, with that and everyone breathing in there, it was uh, surprisingly warm. Most dreaded of all life-saving skills is the ice hole drill. I was the first person to go in um, because I think partly so that everybody could see that, you know, I was prepared to do it. Permission to leave the ice. OK, well done. What are you doing? It was learning actually how cold it was, learning to control yourself in the water, um, not just panicking, um, but to sort of calm yourself down, and then how to survive and, and again, working as a team to get everybody dry and warm again. I actually fell in. <laughs> I managed to get my weight wrong and therefore fell backwards onto my bum and then slid in. I probably never forget quite how cold my, even though I didn't necessarily feel cold, how my body had reacted to the cold. Don't help me! Don't help me! Six months later, the remaining group returns to Luxelva for exercise ice ready. Push. Yep, go, go, go. In. It's the height of Norwegian winter with its challenging short days and long nights. That was by far the best training exercise, I think. I mean, it was really, really tough, really tough. With 22 hours of darkness, your body just got complete, really confused. Um, and you start getting sleepy in the middle of the day. It was really quite claustrophobic as well um, and constantly having to do everything with a head torch. And then obviously in the cold, um, everything freezes in the dark as well, um, which was really, really tough. <laughs> I was a little bit cold you. last night and my hot water bottle made me get up <coughs> in the middle of the night and go for a week. Oh. Ice ready was probably the hardest thing I think I've ever done. I think the idea was to you know, see how people cope at breaking point. It was always 20 hours of darkness, so it's just soul destroying. To build up their exposure to polar conditions, they will spend this exercise living in tents for three weeks. They must also fatten up. Voila. Thank you. In Antarctica, they'll need over 5,000 calories a day. Mm. That's because they'll ski for up to 10 hours a day. So Ice Ready is now the moment to build up their resilience by learning to ski for several hours at a time. There were four of us skiing across this barren wasteland um, and I remember thinking that was the only time I thought, actually, do I really want to do this? The constant darkness was quite difficult to deal with and knowing then that you're going to ski for three hours still in the dark before you get a slight glimpse of sunlight. I'm never one of the strongest one physically um, but I realised I think on that exercise that it was more of a, a psychological challenge. Ice ready was horrible, absolutely horrible. I tried to pull myself off, off it uh, on my birthday. Um, I got to the point where I went, I'm miserable. I'm not enjoying any of this. So I said to Nix, she said, please, can you reconsider? Will you just stay out? Because we've only got, I think it was sort of three days left. Will you stay out? Uh, and I said, fine. And I'm really grateful that she did because I wouldn't have been here today. One of the big things I learned was you don't fight the cold. It's just there, it's just life, and uh, you embrace it and you live with it. In Antarctica, there is a real risk of falling down a crevasse, a deep ice fracture. On the Swiss Alps, the last few candidates are taught how to rescue a fallen teammate by doing it for real. You could put your foot through one and you'd fall several hundred metres, potentially, um, into a dark, cold crevasse and, uh, yeah, break a leg would be a good day. Um, dying would probably not be such a good day. I knew that in Antarctica, because of how remote we were, we would have to do everything all self-rescued. Nobody was coming out to help us. I was really worried about this. I was absolutely petrified of falling. <laughs> we were all very keen to get the, the training done. OK, you ready to go? 
and it gave us so much uh, self-assurance and the ability to trust in the others that, that if one of us fell into a crevasse that we would be able to cope. It's appropriate that the final exercise is called Ice Diamond. The intense two-year training and selection process is coming to its conclusion and the final candidates are polishing the skills they need to cross Antarctica unaided and using muscle power alone. Over 200 soldiers applied for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and now, in their last full exercise, the final six Ice Maidens are confirmed. And I just remember being like, so excited. It almost felt like you'd sort of, the achievement was actually just making the team. And then you had to reality check it. You haven't, you haven't even done the expedition yet. The last ski in on Ice Diamonds was, um, I remember thinking, the next time you're on skis, you'll be in Antarctica. And that was quite a sobering thought. People said to me, this is going to change your life. Uh, and I was like, actually, no, it won't change my life. I'm still going to be me. Um, I'm just going to have been on this journey. But every journey changes your life. Um, uh, and I realised afterwards that it did. After two years of relentless training in Arctic conditions, the six British Army members of Exercise Ice Maiden will now attempt to become the largest all-female group to cross Antarctica on muscle power alone. It will be an epic journey. First, they will fly to their start line on the Leverett Glacier. They'll ski to the South Pole and the first of their resupply points. From here, they will then journey to the Thiel Mountains for their second and final resupply before completing the final leg to Hercules Inlet. They hope to ski the 1,700 kilometers in just under 75 days. After spending the first 14 days at Union Glacier Base Camp, they're off to a flying start to the Leverett Glacier. <laughs> Finally, after 10 years of thought, two years of planning, uh, and training and two weeks of sitting in the Union Glacier, we are finally here. And uh, it's a beautiful day to start. Crossing onto the continent. They soon reach the continent's landmass, the point that marks the official start of their journey from coast to coast. Look at that, new JW. I'm on the continent! They only have 1,684 kilometres to go. The first day, it was bright blue skies, sunny, um, I'm guessing maybe about minus 20, which is a perfectly manageable um, temperature particularly with the sun shining. Um, we thought, this is fantastic. Look at this, this is, this is going to be a breeze. Look, there's even a vehicle track that the Americans have left. We're just going to follow this all the way in. And then the weather kicked in. Day two, we set off and the weather was closing in and we only skied for about an hour. We realised we couldn't go on because I was looking behind me and I could barely see the rest of the team. The sledges, the polks, were getting blown sideways in the wind and flipped and, uh, you know, we were struggling to keep going. We knew over there that the plane couldn't come and fetch us. You know, nobody was going to come and rescue us. We had to survive that on our own. And it was a short, sharp reminder of, of what Antarctica can, can do and what, what she can throw at us. Nine days into their trek and the women face a serious crisis. As they ascend up the glacier, Sandy is struggling with flu and affects team morale. It's day nine and um, I'm just fuming right now. Sandy's been um, struggling today. She's not been feeling very well and uh, we finished early. Um, and it's completely fair enough, she just couldn't go on. I was getting really slow. Um, I was aware that I was holding the others up. 
Um, and that's then a, a risk as well, because if they're not going as fast as they need to to stay warm, I'm putting them at risk of getting hypothermia. I do wonder if it's we might have just in overexcitement, um, just pushed on a little bit too hard. And had we possibly slowed down and and just uh, tried to progress at a you know, slower speed, she might not have suffered as, as badly as she did. What's got me really, really angry and upset is um, the team meeting that we've just had. The vibe in the meeting was just so negative and um, I don't know, I'm just, I mean, we're, we're only 10 days in and if the team is breaking down now, then that's not a good sign. Nick's handled it very well because it was a point where the team could have completely broken down. Um, we all had different opinions. We all have our own demons that, that come up when we're under stress or when we're tired. We'd gone out with six and we wanted to come back with six. It's not really a very successful team if you've not managed to take everybody with you. You know, no man does get left behind or woman. Each member volunteers to carry more of Sandy's kit in their pulks, allowing her and the rest of them to continue on their record-breaking quest. After 26 days, much to their excitement, they reached the Amundsen Scott Research Station at the South Pole. We were about 20 kilometres out and we saw a shape on the horizon and you don't see any shapes when you're in Antarctica. So just seeing something that was a suggestion of life was super exciting. Oh, getting to the South Pole, huge sense of relief, yeah. Um, and it was, it was a big marker, you know, and it was civilization again, or civilization for Antarctica. At the research station, there's an opportunity to enjoy some local hospitality with other polar visitors. Food! Real food! Peas and everything. And tea! With a tea bag! And out of the blue, they also receive some surprise letters from home. Huge surprise to all of us. We didn't know this was coming. Um, and we well, we hadn't had contact with home, uh, and it was yeah emotionally it was just too much for all of us. Yeah. Despite having their passports stamped, they've only completed a third of their journey. It's all like well, past the South Pole. Well, it's only a third of the way. <laughs> We've still got a very long way to go. Two-thirds of the journey left and the women are skiing around 10 hours a day, covering 30 kilometres. On average, they ski up to 75 minutes at a time. They take turns leading, with the front person most at risk of falling down a crevasse. Between skiing, they must take regular eating breaks, food is fuel, and a diet of flapjacks, nuts and cheese provides the minimum 5,000 calories they need each day. Throughout their trek across the South Pole, these six women will share many intimate moments. Happy birthday, dear Zana. Happy birthday to you. Oh my God. Hey, Merry Christmas to you all. That is the last day of 2017. We spent 50 nights together. That's a lot. So this is the toilet pit I've just dug. It's got a bit of a back wall to protect your bum from the wind. It's got two good solid foot plates and the hole in the middle for, for everything. You're on camera! <laughs> this is my favourite time of the day. I love it because I just get into the sleeping bag and stretch my limbs oh, out. And plop. <laughs> oh, and it feels wonderful. After loading up at Thiel Mountains, their second and final resupply point, they turn towards the finishing line at Hercules Inlet. 
but with heavier pulks and a further 500 kilometres to go, mental fatigue kicks in. By the time we got to Thiel, we thought we've got a, you know, a, an empty sledge now, it should be quite easy, and it just wasn't. So that was a bit depressing, and then you think, right, we're getting a whole new batch of food, so it's going to get really heavy again. Um, and people were a little bit sort of fed up by then, I think. The last bit was really quite tiring we just wanted I think everybody was just a bit sick of it now we'd done the routine we were just fed up with it all and we just wanted to get home there's that debate whether it's worth going faster um, and getting tired or going a bit slower and then and going for longer I was just um, a bit frustrated at the end when we were making a decision as to whether to do the extra quarter of an hour for both legs. Can we not go flat out? And I did feel that we went pretty flat mm. out. No one at any point asked for slow down. I, I don't dare <coughs> ask you to slow down because you said it hurts when you go because, slow. So no, I don't want to ski past six o'clock. Okay. But, but yes, it was right to ski past six o'clock, but I should have been more obvious with that being my opinion rather than being like, I don't care. These daily wash-up meetings allow opinions to be aired and glue the team together as they complete their final days towards the finish. We basically finish a week today, so it's pretty exciting. Because tomorrow, I can say, it's our last Sunday on the ice. It's our last Monday on the ice. Finally, after almost two months and skiing for 1,700 kilometres, the final crossing line is within sight. So the last day, um, we had a bit of downhill. We hadn't really had any downhill properly before, uh, and it causes issues on Nordic skis with a, a sledge that's on a rope which then swings in front of you. And uh, <laughs> it was quite icy as well, and then the vis started to drop. And we knew there was a, well, I was panicking because it was a crevasse risk area. When you get to the finish line, there is no line. Uh, there is no one there to greet you. You just kind of go, I finished that. We finished. <laughs> and that's about it. The Ice Maidens ski from the 80th to the 79th degree marking the official completion of their epic Antarctic crossing. So this is it, we just crossed the, just crossed the finish line and then actually, actually I'm really surprised and emotional. Um, um, I'm not really sure what to do, but it's not often that you set a dream and um, spend two years working Six women, 62 days, a record breaking achievement. As well as being the first all female group to cross Antarctica using muscle power alone, they've also become the largest team in history. They've achieved their personal dreams and performed a remarkable feat of endurance. As the Ice Maidens fly home, they can reflect on what they've accomplished. I love the fact that we can inspire um, other people to do something because we're all just very ordinary girls. It's not about you as an individual, it's about you working with this team and doing something together. It takes the pressure off, it's relaxing, it's satisfying, it's just the most incredible feeling of that sort of belonging. It was an amazing opportunity uh, and I'm so lucky to have been able to do something amazing with such a, a, an awesome group of women. We are just very ordinary women and we just happened to do something quite unique um, but it took a lot of planning and preparation and anyone could do it.